And Mario? Okay. I was just going to ask if we can record, but I think we're I think we're fine, Mario's, right? Of course. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I I want the 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 record of the presentation. Amazing. We got you covered. Yes. We're it's recording on the cloud. Transcription and everything. <laughs> Nice. Let me share my screen so Yeah, you can try it out. I think you should be able to do it now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Crystal clear. Yes. White white screen um resolution. Okay. So, Marios, where are you at right now? I am in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Oh, nice. What, which direction do you face? I face towards uh, west. Oh, nice. Okay. You're facing UCLA. That's good. Yes, I'm facing UCLA. Amazing. Not USC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. I face primarily towards UCLA. Amazing. Okay, that's good. That's the way it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who from USC in the in the co-host? I feel like uh, Piyush, Piyush is USC, so he doesn't like what I'm saying right now. <laughs> I, I would love to hear uh, his response live. <laughs> I, I, I have taught at uh, USC too, in addition to UCLA. A graduate course, so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I need to to remain uh, as uh, unbiased and objective as possible. Neutral. <laughs> I don't, I don't think we can do that, Mario. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, <laughs> you're gonna have to pick a side. Okay, I, I, I respect your uh, <laughs> your leadership. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not create controversies live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll we'll take it off the call. Um. Yeah, I think that that sounds great. Um, yeah, uh, Piyush, if you want to kick things off. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, or, think it's yeah. time for, so I think Patricia can start with introducing a bit about PSC and then we can move with the introduction of a speaker by Franco and to the <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, um, do we need the slides, Omar, or can you just talk? Is that cool? Yeah, whichever way you want to take it. We're super flexible. Yeah, so hi everyone. Thanks for coming. We are the PSC, which stands for Peer Student Committee, and our mission is essentially to engage students in peer activities and enhance student education in earthquake engineering and related fields. We have four branches, which is the core professional research and outreach, and the seminar series are brought to you by the professional team, where we invite industry experts to talk about their work and projects. And then each of the other branches have each of their seminars. So the research has seminars where they will invite researchers to talk about their work. And then the outreach has a program that pairs undergrads with grads. And um, well, essentially, we're just trying to engage students from all across the United States, particularly uh, within the Western coast of the United States. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if, if you want to be involved in here, we would love to hear back from you. And now we can go ahead with the seminar. Okay. Okay, uh, I, I, I will present you, Marius. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Carlos Franco Mayorga. I'm serving as an officer for the Professional Peer Student uh, Committee. 
And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker for the first Industry Insights Seminar Series organized by the uh, Peer Student Committee. Uh, he has exten extensive experience in both academia and industry, making him a perfect match uh, uh, with the objectives uh, of the Professional Peer Student uh, Subcommittee. I'm talking about uh, uh, Dr. Marius Panayoto, who is a senior consultant uh, and Navi Joseph Associates in uh, Los Angeles, founder of Abstran and the online school of earthquake engineering and design, uh, earthquake uh, resilient design. Uh, his PhD studies on the seismic design analysis and shake table testing of a full scale seven story uh, building received the uh, 2012 ASCE Alfred Nobel Prize. Uh, until 2015, he was an assistant professor of structural engineering at UC Berkeley, conducting uh, uh, research on the seismic analysis the, uh, design and experimental testing of reinforced concrete structures, as well as on earthquake resilient uh, buildings and bridges that use seismic isolation, rocking components, and high performance materials. Uh, his engineering practices work focuses on the advanced design, seismic analysis, and design of large, complex, and earthquake resilient and seismically, seismically isolated structures, including high rise buildings and stadiums. Uh, Marius is going to present uh, the title Beyond Standard Performance Based Design, Based Seismic Design, to towards uh, earthquake resilient design of reinforced concrete wall buildings at near four sites. Uh, well, thank you, Marius, for being here. Uh, the microphone is uh, all yours. <laughs> Franco, thank you very much for the introduction and also uh, all the peer student committee for the, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's really my pleasure to, uh, to be here with you and sharing uh, some of the work uh, that uh, uh, I have done uh, the last nearly 20 years both on uh, research as well as on um, uh, engineering uh, practice of uh, development of uh, earthquake resilient uh, uh, buildings at, uh, at near fault sites. So as uh, Franco introduced me, uh, I did my PhD at UC San Diego. Uh, I completed my PhD at, uh, I graduated on uh, 2008, uh, immediately after uh, the completion of my PhD, I became uh, an assistant professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, where uh, I worked there for seven years, between 2008 and 2015, doing work on um, uh, earthquake structural engineering and development of earthquake resilient bridges and, uh, and uh, buildings. And since uh, 2015, uh, I have been uh, a senior consultant for uh, Nabi Youssef and Associates. Uh, I work uh, for uh, in uh, our office, in our main office in uh, in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and my work again specializes and focuses on um, uh, earthquake, uh, earthquake resilient designs of uh, complex and uh, large structures, such as tall buildings, stadiums, and structures with seismic isolation. And uh, I'm also founder of the online school of earthquake resilient design since uh, 2018, which uh, I offer some uh, online courses, primarily pre-recorded lectures, uh, uh, trying to transfer uh, this experience and the work that uh, I have done. And uh, recently I founded also the, uh, the company Astran, Advanced Structural Analysis, where we provide the software BTM component, uh, which is uh, uh, implemented in the software FE Maldifis uh, of Professor Kuchumanos at Virginia Tech. And you are going to hear many things about these uh, developments and work that uh, we have been doing during the presentation. So uh, the subject of my today's presentation is uh, uh, the steps and the work that we have been doing in order to, to gradually go beyond performance-based seismic design where I'm sure that all of you, you have uh, heard and you have studied and uh, you have seen many things about and going towards earthquake resilient design, which we are going to, to, to define it, review the definition in the, 
during the presentation of reinforced concrete wall buildings. And I focus primarily at near fault sites because these are the sites uh, at which uh, history of uh, recent, not only recent, of earthquakes in general has shown us that uh, the majority of, uh, of uh, severe damage and uh, losses uh, develop. And uh, this is what makes the earthquake uh, engineering problem really challenging and interesting, how we can uh, efficiently uh, design for these uh, very challenging demands at near fault sites. Let me start by a quick uh, overview. And uh, here on this table, I have selected three uh, earthquake events in, from uh, recent history, the Chrysler 2011, the Kobe 1995, and the Sichuan in China of 2008. These are events that cover a wide range of uh, earthquake magnitude, as you see, from 6.2 all the way to the huge uh, China earthquake of magnitude 7.9, which, by the way, is very is similar to the recent disaster in uh, Turkey and uh, and uh, Syria. And the reason that I summarize uh, uh, and I choose these uh, three events as an example is because here we can see a variety of uh, of damage and losses in terms of of course how many people died and uh, and uh, how many structures were destroyed as well as economical losses for for a range of uh, of uh, earthquake magnitudes and the, all these three events the damage was uh, uh, most of the damage developed at near fault sites the the site from which uh, i i give you this uh, presentation uh, i am located in downtown los angeles and you see here on the screen i highlight the the, the map taken from ucgs showing the the active major faults near downtown LA, which is one of the sites with the highest seismic hazard in the uh, US. And uh, you can see a large number of uh, faults, at least six faults, which are very close to from where I'm speaking right now, that contribute to the majority of the seismic hazard. And uh, of course, a little bit further away, not a little bit, quite further away, and actually this is very good news, is the is the San Andreas Fault, which can uh, result to an earthquake of uh, magnitude 8 or, or even uh, larger. And uh, uh, putting some uh, um, within the context of, uh, of uh, code minimum design and uh, prescriptive requirements that we have, I show you also in this slide, the, the seismic design spectra for the maximum considered earthquake at uh, this site, which is again, as I told you, one of the sites that represent the uh, very well the, the high seismic hazard that we have in uh, in many sites in uh, in uh, southern and northern California, as well as in uh, in uh, central, where you see that the the spectral demands are of the order of uh, 1.3 g at one second period and the, where the displacement spectrum has a slope of approximately 0.33 meters uh, per second. So let's review the definition of what is a near fault site uh, based on the, on the definition that it was included in uh, AAC 716. So near fault sites depend on the magnitude of the, of the earthquakes that, uh, we, that the, the active faults near these sites are capable of, uh, of, uh, of giving. And uh, for, uh, for faults that they are capable of giving a, an earthquake of magnitude between six and seven, it is described as sites that they are uh, no more than 10 kilometers or 6.25 miles, if you prefer, from the, from the projection of the fault surface on, um, from the site. And for uh, earthquake magnitudes la larger than, than seven, uh, this distance extends to 15 uh, kilometers from the, from the surface uh, projection of the, of the fault rupture. Uh, a, a relatively recent earthquake that uh, uh, taught us many lessons and we obtained a lot of knowledge about the, the performance, uh, the seismic response and performance of both old and modern structures was the Christchurch New Zealand earthquake, which was a, a moderate earthquake. It was not very large, but 
it was a significant earthquake event of magnitude 6.2 with a special feature that it occurred only five kilometers from downtown Christchurch in New Zealand, which is a, a, a moderate size a urban, uh, let's say, center with uh, less than 400,000 uh, people. So here you see a photo before the earthquake and during the earthquake with the first uh, dust uh, uh, from the from uh, the two collapses that uh, occurred in this earthquake. And the very uh, peculiar and characteristic feature of this earthquake, it is that despite that only two buildings collapsed, more than uh, approximately more than two thirds of the buildings in downtown uh, uh, Christchurch, they had to be demolished after the earthquake due to significant damage uh, beyond uh, 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 repairability. Some other events that they have caused major damage in recent history and, uh, and we have learned a lot. And actually they shaped the changes of uh, our seismic design philosophy uh, worldwide is the 1994 Cobb earthquake with more than 5,000 people that died in this earthquake and huge damage within five kilometers from the fault rupture in a major urban, urban center and the largest port of Japan, as well as the Chichi uh, 1999 huge earthquake with uh, some of the uh, strongest ground motions that we have ever recorded, especially at long periods. And the very similar observations, I think uh, we will soon have from the, from the recent uh, Turkey and uh, Syria uh, earthquake. On the other hand, in uh, in US, we also had some uh, uh, major earthquakes, relatively close to to major urban centers, but not as close in order to have, uh, uh, let's say, these features that would characterize these events as major earthquakes at near fault sites of uh, major urban centers. And let me give you a first example with the Loma Prieta earthquake. 1989, magnitude 6.9, where 63 people died. At the left, you see the shaking uh, intensity uh, fault uh, map, including the, the projection of the fault with the epicenter showed with the star, uh, compared with, of course, with the distances and the major urban centers of San Jose, East Bay, and San Francisco. And uh, here, the characteristic was that uh, uh, all the the, uh, the surface projection of the fault was uh, under uh, a, a national park, essentially. So the, the, um, the real stations and the maximum considered earthquake level of ground motion that we have, the, the records, are essentially mostly in regions which uh, were the trees. So these are the good news. We shake the trees with the with a maximum considered earthquake level of shaking, but not our uh, major urban centers. Because even San Jose, as you can see from the map, was uh, the center of San Jose, was uh, more than two, 10, 15 kilometers away from, uh, from the last uh, uh, edge of the, of the fault. Despite this, we had also some serious damage even very far away at uh, nearly 80 kilometers from the fault and you see the collapse of the Cypress freeway in Auckland, which resulted in most out of the 63 deaths that, uh, that occurred in this earthquake. Kind of similar, but not identical, I think, conditions in the Northridge earthquake, where uh, again, the, the fault here was closer to, to let's say our uh, major urban regions, but not so close again in order to be characterized as a near fault because it was almost 40 kilometers from uh, downtown Los Angeles and more than 25 kilometers from uh, Hollywood, Beverly Hills and the, and the major part of central Los Angeles. The, the major epicenter was in the Northridge area and uh, in the valley, which is uh, primarily suburban uh, area with uh, mostly with one and two story uh, wood, uh, uh, timber structures and the directivity here, the fault rupture was towards the north, towards the mountain. And actually this was a very good uh, thing because in a, 
if if the directivity was towards downtown LA or towards uh, Hollywood and central LA, I believe that the damage would be higher. And another good thing was that when this earthquake happened, it was very early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Most people were sleeping. So this is, uh, I think it was uh, uh, very fortunate because otherwise with these collapses that we have in some of the highways, the, the fatalities, the number of deaths uh, could have increased significantly if it was during traffic and the rush hour. This is just uh, uh, to refresh your memory about the history of earthquakes in US and uh, what we have learned and uh, what are the implications for, for damage that we may expect in more, how to say, detrimental earthquake events with the worst conditions in, uh, in future. So here I summarize in this slide the, the strongest uh, response spectra, the response spectra of the strongest ground motions that we have recorded in uh, various uh, earthquakes of magnitude ranging from 6.2 all the way to 7.6. And I compare it with the displacement spectrum for the maximum considered earthquake of downtown Los Angeles. So one thing that we need to realize here is that in all these uh, near fault uh, events, the, the worst ground motions that we have recorded, and this does not mean that these are the worst ground motions that they happen, because depends where we had instruments available. So the worst ground motions that we have recorded result in spectra that exceed our, uh, let's say, nearly maximum spectra that uh, we use for the maximum considered earthquake in US. And uh, this level of exceedance increases with increase of magnitude of the earthquake, both in terms of period range, but also in terms of amplitude, as you can see, I, I hope uh, that the graph is clear enough to, to convey uh, this, uh, this message. So the main message that I want to pass with this uh, uh, graphic is that when we talk about maximum considered earthquake, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but at the same time, the near fault events, the ground motions that we should expect, the level of shaking is very strong. And it, is, it makes our work as uh, engineers and as uh, researchers very challenging and very difficult because to design efficiently for these demands and also analyze accurately, uh, it involves a large number of uh, complexities, uh, which uh, some of them we will see in the rest of the, of the presentation. In terms of damage in uh, reinforced concrete wall buildings, we have seen in recent earthquakes, various types of uh, severe damage that results in buildings that they cannot be repaired after the earthquake and they have to be demolished. In the uh, Incobe earthquake, in Chile earthquake, a lot of damage, uh, as well as in New Zealand. And uh, I would like to mention that the majority of this damage, of course, it is in structures designed with all the code provision. And this is simply because, you know, with our modern designs, we will know how well they will perform in future earthquakes. You know, the, the best labo uh, laboratory is, uh, is a real earthquake. And, uh, but this is why we continue studying the, our modern designs and we continue improving our seismic design uh, procedures and techniques with uh, testing. And uh, on the subject of uh, response and behavior of reinforced concrete walls, we have, uh, we have a wealth of information from testing where we have uh, uh, studied various failure modes, including bar buckling and rupture of reinforced concrete walls, diagonal tension failure, crashing of the web, global out of plane uh, buckling and instability, as well as out of plane crashing of walls. The reason that I mentioned this, it is because since our seismic design uh, philosophy and practice uh, evolves and we move from uh, code minimum prescriptive design towards control of damage and, uh, and the development of more uh, earthquake resilient uh, urban centers. It is very important that uh, our uh, computational uh, uh, modeling techniques, our seismic analysis and uh, design to be able to capture this type of, uh, 
uh, damage and failure modes and all the implications, because if we are not able to capture in the computer the, the development of damage, then uh, it is very difficult to, to reliably control and design in order to, to improve and reduce this type of, uh, of damages. So a quick summary in terms of the state of uh, seismic design philosophy and the design practice in, uh, in US these days. The majority of the reinforced concrete wall buildings are designed based on code prescriptive design, which uh, at least up to about approximately 200 and feet, 240 feet tall buildings, where we use linear response spectrum analysis uh, with an R factor of equal to six to, to determine the design forces. And of course, we design for the design earthquake, which is two thirds of the maximum considered earthquake. The drift limit that we have for depending on the risk category for most of these buildings is 2% for the design earthquake. Uh, we expect a low probability of collapse given the, the occurrence of the maximum considered earthquake, but we do no analysis in order to quantify explicitly this probability of collapse in, uh, in uh, our practice. And of course, as you know, our code procedures have zero consideration of damage, downtime, and repairability. Uh, along these lines, of course, we have the performance-based seismic design, which primarily is used for buildings, reinforced concrete wall buildings, which are taller than 240 feet. And the main difference in performance-based design compared with the uh, code prescriptive, code minimum design, it is that we use nonlinear response history analysis for the maximum considered earthquake. So number one, we use a much more accurate method of analysis. So we calculate the demands much more uh, accurately. And also we calculate the response explicitly for the maximum considered earthquake, something which we do not consider in the code minimum design. We have a drift limit of uh, uh, 3% for the maximum considered earthquake and uh, a CR stress limit for the walls. And I emphasize this parameter because in most designs, this is what controls the thickness and the design of walls of 7.5 square root F prime C expected, where F prime C expected is the expected uh, compression strength of concrete. And we evaluate this CR stress limits for 1.5 times the mean uh, demands uh, that we obtain from the uh, maximum considered earthquake. Uh, at the same time, there is no explicit, again, calculation of probability of collapse, of damage, and of functionally, of functional recovery time. In other words, how long it will take, if we can, to repair the damage and uh, have the building uh, uh, fully functional after an earthquake. And uh, then gradually we have, let's say, the, the more, the most advanced uh, state of uh, seismic design, which I call here earthquake resilient design, where we explicitly uh, try to control damage and functional recovery time by calculating, at least for the design earthquake, by, by trying to estimate uh, the damage and also the, the, the losses and the, and the repair time. This is the earthquake resilient design. It's something that you know, many, many researchers and practitioners have worked on and contributed for decades, but it's not something, uh, something new. These ideas and this work has started uh, more than two decades now. And uh, here I show you an example from a part of work that I did as part of my PhD, where we explicitly designed uh, a seven story reinforced concrete wall building to go beyond the code minimum requirements to control uh, structural damage and uh, uh, result in a structure that after at least the design earthquake or for even stronger shaking, that we can have a building that can be occupied uh, with the damage being easily repaired. And how we achieved this? We use nonlinear dynamic analysis. We accounted explicitly for the effect of uh, coupling between the slabs and the walls. We control the CR stresses and uh, we limit it to, 
less than four times square root of prime C, which is uh, less than 50% of the limits used in performance-based design. And also we controlled intentionally the amount of flexural steel uh, to make sure that we don't have uh, something, a, a failure that is going to be, or damage that is going to be compression control. And uh, we did uh, uh, some special detailing of the boundary elements. You see here in the slide at the top right, the comparison of the design spectrum for Los Angeles that we had back then versus the strongest ground motion that we use in the test. It is a ground motion, a near fault actually ground motion from the 1994 Northridge earthquake. And you see that for most of the periods, this ground motion exceeds the, the design earthquake. So you can consider it as, as a ground motion that it was in between the design earthquake and the maximum considered earthquake, but closer, closer to the design level. So in this video, we are going to see the response of the structure and the damage that it was developed for this uh, peak, uh, uh, strongest ground motion that we use. 2.4%, it was the peak story drift ratio that we developed. 2.7%, the, the maximum strain recorded at the steel. 60% uh, the base year, huge base year coefficient for reasons that we will explain. And the less than 0.1% residual based. So we will start the video seeing the response from far away, the global response, and then we will zoom in the plastic hinge region at the bottom of the wall. It's a near fault motion, so everything happens really fast within five, maximum six seconds. This is the plastic hinge region where you see the opening, the opening of the of the flexural cracks. And now we zoom at the top of the wall where we recorded the peak strain of 2.7%, where you see the crack opening, but uh, minor damage. Essentially, just a little bit of spalling of the unconfined concrete with the cracks uh, almost nearly fully closed at the end uh, of the earthquake. So this is uh, just a first example how more than 15 years ago, we design explicitly and we validate this design with, uh, with uh, full-scale testing of how you can control damage and, uh, and uh, have uh, uh, reinforced concrete walls that uh, sustain uh, the demands that uh, we expect in uh, near fault uh, earthquake events without having to demolish uh, your structure after uh, after an earthquake. And again, I mentioned that we achieved this for a level of shaking a bit, a little bit stronger than the the design level earthquake. We didn't go all the way to the to the MCI. So this is what we recorded in the test. And the main thing that you need to keep here it is that uh, it was very important the effect of the higher modes and uh, primarily the second mode of response, as well as of the framing effects, the coupling between the slab and the walls. So with the yellow line, you see the story CR forces that we will obtain in the computer. If we were doing just a simple nonlinear pushover analysis, considering only the web part of the wall, uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, something that I, I didn't describe before, the, the section of the wall if you see in the video, it is a T wall with, without establishing the connection between the web and the plants uh, for reasons that I don't have time to, to, to explain uh, here. So all, all the things that I, I present, the yellow line that you see here is assuming that we do a pushover analysis of the web wall only. While with the red, you see the story shares that we recorded for the strongest ground motion in the earthquake four, and you see an amplification of the order of 400%. So let me explain you what caused this amplification. This amplification, it was caused because there was a significant coupling with the slabs and with the flange, which, uh, which I highlight with the cyan color uh, at the bottom of the CR force uh, diagram. So essentially the wall acted as a T wall instead of a, of a cantilever web wall. 
and uh, the rest, uh, at least 50% of the overstrength was the effect of the higher modes and the second mode that, uh, that uh, brings the resultant force very close, closer to lower than 50% of the height of the building. And this results in an, in an additional increase of the shear force demands. Uh, the good news is that uh, finally in ACI, we account for these effects for the shear amplification, but uh, we started to account uh, for these effects effectively January 1st of this year. And uh, this is, uh, uh, is doing through the amplified design shear where there is a, a factor, uh, the overstrength factor with the capital, with uppercase uh, omega um, symbol and uh, a lowercase omega for the higher modes. So the product of these two factors results in the amplification uh, factor of the code prescribed uh, seismic forces uh, de uh, denoted here with this view. This is something not new for the world. Actually, the New Zealand uh, code has uh, very similar provisions since 1982, one year after uh, I was born. Actually, today is my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, this work appears also in uh, the, the pioneering work, of course, of Priestley and Polly in the book. Eurocode has also similar provisions since the early 2000s, and also in US, in the CIOP Blue Book, uh, these uh, amplifications were explicitly uh, defined and, uh, and stated. But unfortunately, we started to use them in our codes uh, only uh, very recently. In actual practice, now all of these concepts that I presented you so far, I had the luck and the opportunity to, to apply many of these uh, ideas in collaboration with, uh, with uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleagues here at uh, Nabi Youssef Associates for the development of the earthquake resilient design of the new Long Beach Civic Center. So this is uh, uh, the project consisted of these two essentially twin uh, buildings with 11 stories above ground where while most of these uh, structures are designed based on code minimum requirements, here uh, in collaboration, of course, with uh, the city of Long Beach, we had the significantly enhanced and elevated requirements in order to control damage and downtime. And I describe you briefly, we had the, the criteria included uh, for the 10% in 50 years earthquake, which is close to, the, to what we call the design earthquake. Uh, we had uh, a requirement to be able to reoccupy the building in uh, less than seven days after this uh, design earthquake, to, have, uh, to achieve functional recovery in less than 30 days. So the building to be in uh, almost full functionality 30 days after the earthquake, to control the losses and the repair cost to less than 5% of the replacement cost of the building, and uh, of course, this is always the number one uh, uh, priority in all seismic designs to, to have the safety of occupants with making the, uh, even the physical injury due to component failure of uh, occupants very unlikely. And how we did this, how we achieved this. The procedure again was, we used nonlinear performance-based seismic analysis, of course, to have a very accurate a calculation of the, of the demands. We use the FEMA P58 methodology uh, in combination with the, with the ready criteria developed uh, uh, by ARUP. The FEMA P58 methodology, for those of you that you are not aware, is, a, is a developed for many, for many years uh, methodology by FEMA, which allow you to explicitly calculate the downtime and repair cost. And uh, recently, uh, this procedure is facilitated by the SP3 software of the Hasselton uh, Baker uh, Risk Group, which is something that we also used in this project. This is a video, a time lapse from the construction of the of the of the two buildings. And uh, in terms of engineering response parameters and how and, and what were the implications and the and the result of the elevated. Uh, design criteria. 
at the end of the day, the main features of this design, it is that we design to experience no more than 1% drift in the in the walls. And this allow us to control, to control and limit both structural and non-structural damage. And also uh, using the increased acceleration demands that we obtain from uh, nonlinear response history analysis. And by using a response modification factor for the for the anchorage for the acceleration sensitive non-structural components to to reduce and control significantly the damage in the acceleration sensitive non-structural parts. Of course, all these things had a direct effect on the on the on the cost of the of the structure. But here is. Uh, I think uh, an excellent example of how all this knowledge of uh, of controlling of damage and the repair time and downtime were used, uh, and uh, we deliver, uh, I believe, uh, an excellent uh, uh, design. Uh, so the city of Long Beach and the headquarters of the of the port of Los Angeles will have not only a safe but a resilient a resilient structure for for many decades. So as I told you before, uh, the response of reinforced concrete walls, it's uh, very complex, especially the highly, the highly nonlinear response uh, for uh, near fault uh, uh, ground motions. And it is very important that we are able in, uh, with our computational methods to be able to capture uh, this type of damage and failure modes so that we can improve our designs and, and methods to, to reduce and hopefully one day to to minimize this level of damage for this reason with a large number of collaborators we have developed this uh, uh, seismic analysis method called the beam trust model for enforced concrete wall buildings which uh, initially was implemented in uh, in uh, open seas i did this work and the implementation to get uh, with my former phd student dr uh, yuan lu uh, who uh, did uh, all this uh, uh, development and implementation related to open seas. And uh, since then, we have done a lot of uh, progress and uh, uh, a lot of uh, improvements and enhancements in the method uh, with an implementation in the program FE Multifis created by Professor Kutsumanos at University of Virginia Tech. Uh, and uh, we have reached a point that uh, uh, we can uh, confidently say, and we have proofs for this because we have published extensively, that uh, we can capture essentially all critical uh, types of uh, damage and failure modes that we have uh, uh, we have observed in experimental testing and in uh, in real earthquakes, and we have validated the method with more than twenty five experimental tests, and uh, with. Again, this is a result of a large number of uh, collaborations with various uh, uh, co-authors, as you see at the bottom of the slide. And I would like, I'm taking the opportunity to thank all of them for their collaboration and work. And uh, we recently, the last year, we won actually two blind predictions. The method won two blind predictions on uh, uh, relevant simulations of uh, reinforced concrete walls uh, for one, and the second blind prediction was uh, uh, won by Dr. Uh, Girgin in Turkey, was uh, a CR critical column. So a few words of how the method works. Here I show you a C-shaped wall, and uh, which is discretized with these elements that we call the BTM uh, cell uh, elements. And each cell consists of uh, six, six internal elements two vertical fiber in fiber uh, section nonlinear beam elements, two horizontal, which are also fiber section beam elements, and two diagonal elements that uh, represent the, uh, the diagonal compression field of concrete. So these diagonal elements, they capture the, the biaxial behavior of concrete. So they communicate with the, with the, with the four nodes so we can capture the effect of uh, that a normal tension strain has in the compression field of concrete, which makes it weaker and uh, and uh, and uh, and more uh, and uh, and softer. Uh, so all these formulations that you see here, 
we have made it much more efficient these days in the program FEMAL diffuse, where we essentially we define uh, BTM uh, cell elements, four nodes elements, and uh, we make uh, the implementation and the section definition and the material properties uh, much more automated compared with the version that we had uh, in OpenSys. These are the, the materials, the constitutive laws. This is for, for concrete, including the biaxial effects. And uh, this is the material that we use uh, for steel based on the work of uh, Kim and Professor Kuchumanos. And here I show you an example from a cyclic uh, test of uh, reinforcing steel of Professor Estrepo at UCSD with uh, bar buckling and rupture. And uh, this is a, a type of behavior that we model explicitly at the material level with the Kim and Kutrumanos model that allows for capturing both the effect of bar buckling and, uh, and fracture. Some examples from our validations, we have essentially captured all critical uh, failure modes, starting with a very complex uh, uh, mixed diagonal and vertical tension failure that you see at the left of a ductile modern wall, uh, boundary crossing, uh, a case uh, shown in the middle uh, case study, as well as out of plane uh, buckling and instability uh, of a modern, again, ductile wall uh, showing uh, in the, uh, at the right uh, column of, uh, of this slide. Uh, very important is the effect that we capture explicitly the effect of nonlinear flexure shear interaction and this type of uh, damage and failures that uh, all the squat walls develop with these major diagonal failures that you see on the screen. This is a test uh, uh, conducted by Mestianik, uh, a student of uh, Professor Polly in the 80s in uh, New Zealand. And here a video showing the comparison of our simulation for this specimen versus the experimentally measured response with excellent result in terms of uh, both the force displacement response as well as the, the failure uh, pattern. Similar level of uh, accuracy and, uh, and uh, results for flange walls. This is a test uh, conducted by Professor Bayer, Professors Bayer, Dacia and Priestley in, uh, in Europe uh, with a C-shaped wall that experienced uh, um, web crossing uh, under multi-axial multi loading. And again, we had, uh, we had excellent results in capturing this type of behavior and, um, and damage. And very relevant to this is the blind prediction contest that we won last year in collaboration under the leadership of uh, Professor Marius Mavros in Cyprus and together with Professor uh, Juan Murcia del So in, uh, in the University of uh, Catalonia in, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona. So this blind prediction had to do with testing. Uh, it, it was a blind prediction that was organized by UC Leuven in Belgium where they tested uh, 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 two C-shaped walls. One test was in, uh, in, uh, in flexure under, under single directional moment and another under torsion. And uh, we had again, excellent results and we won uh, in both categories, this uh, blind uh, prediction, being able not only to capture the force uh, displacement uh, response very accurately, but also the failure and damage uh, pattern. Another video uh, making it now a little bit more complex with uh, the behavior of uh, the dynamic behavior actually here of coupled walls where the walls experience diagonal tension failure at the base. And uh, this tension failure was affected by the very strong coupling that uh, this specimen experienced uh, because of the coupling beams and the, and the slabs. Um, and proceeding now to more system level validations, the beam trans model, both in OpenSys as well as in FE Multifis, has been used to, uh, for full system simulations. And here you see an example from a collapse simulation uh, by Professor Estrepo and his collaborators at, uh, at UCSD, where uh, they were able to, to, to reproduce and capture many of the aspects of the collapse of the Alto Rio building. Uh, which, uh, as you know, collapsed during the 
2010 uh, very large uh, Chile earthquake. This is, uh, to my best knowledge, one, if not the largest finite element model that has been developed for a building with more than uh, 280,000 elements. Uh, again, with this work being conducted in, uh, in OpenSys. So closing this part of the presentation, these days we have reached a point with this uh, beam trust model in the program FE Multifis, uh, created by Professor Kutsumanos, where we can even uh, compute explicitly and simulate the collapse of all buildings. And here I show you an example where we, from a collapse simulation of a building typical of 1950s or 60s construction in California, where we actually can, can capture explicitly the shear failures and the, and, the, and the collapse of the walls and the columns, which, which essentially they touch the ground in these uh, simulations. For those of you that you are interested, uh, all the development that we have done for the for the BTM uh, uh, framework in the program FE Multifis is available with uh, free tutorials and manuals uh, uh, through my webpage at the online school. So you can find all this information available, and we uh, we provide also free trial versions for uh, academic research for the for the program. Another thing, another development that we recently completed is that we have uh, developed this uh, software called the BTM component, which to make the long story short, this is a software that uh, uh, is, is developed and distributed from uh, Astra. And uh, essentially what we have achieved with this software, it is that you can model uh, any uh, simple uh, planar uh, section or barbell uh, section, the one that you see with pilasters at the bottom left of the screen, uh, walls, columns, beam, and, uh, and uh, in uh, less than an hour in most cases, obtain uh, results from the cyclic response, including capturing all the, all the critical failure modes of uh, reinforced concrete components using a fully automated uh, pre and post processor that we have developed for develop for uh, definition of materials, loading, boundary conditions, as well as post processing and uh, uh, understanding of the results and the failure uh, modes. Now, continuing with some recent studies that uh, we have been doing in collaboration with uh, uh, with uh, Professor Mavros, Professor Estrepo, Professor Kutumanos, and Doctor. Alvarez, uh, this is a 14-story building uh, designed with the California Building Code of 2019. So it is considered a very modern reinforced concrete core wall building where uh, we, we studied using the BTM in FE multi -FIS, the fully nonlinear uh, behavior and response of this, uh, of this uh, structure using triaxial ground motions. And I mentioned that here we model all the structural elements in the nonlinear range, including the pond tension slabs, something that uh, we usually, we don't do even in, uh, in performance-based seismic analysis and design practice. One feature of this design that you see here that I would like to stress, it is that the confinement is limited only at the corners and at the ends of the, of the of the C sections, and this is something import, very important and critical for for the vulnerability of the specific uh, design. And uh, we are going to see some parts of the simulation. We conducted uh, both uh, uh, nonlinear cyclic uh, uh, static loading, but also nonlinear response history analysis using uh, triaxial ground motion. We are going to focus mostly on the response for one of the of the uh, triaxial ground motions but before doing that i would like to 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 stress and emphasize some of the of the of the key conclusions that we have from these studies and key capabilities that we have with the method first of all 
this is something that is known, but despite that it is recognized, uh, we don't consider it in, uh, in, uh, in standard nonlinear seismic analysis uh, practice or even research in uh, many times. First of all, it is that the nonlinear flexure shear interaction is very important for this type of, uh, of buildings, uh, which corresponds, or it is translated if you prefer, to the fact that plane sections do not remain plane. So, uh, and this is something that has very serious implications because by the time that uh, you use uh, like fiber models, uh, which do not consider the nonlinear flexure shear interaction, or even other models that consider the nonlinear flexure shear interaction, but they use, they still use the plane sections remain plane as action. It is for sure that there is no way that accurately you can calculate the, uh, the accurately the strain demands and distributions that you have in this very complex multi-axial uh, type of behavior that flanged and coupled core walls uh, develop. And here is a characteristic example of the type of damage that these core walls uh, develop, where you see the crushing and the significant shear deformations under skew loading at the, at the base uh, corner, one of the four corners of the, of the core wall. And another thing that we have, um, we have observed as part of these studies and, uh, and uh, we used it to improve uh, the BTM model, it is that, uh, that a large part, nearly 20% of the base shear resistance of these core walls is because of out of plane shear in the, in the compression resisting uh, flanges uh, and, uh, and uh, webs. And uh, the most recent version of the beam truss model in FE Maltaifis, we even account explicitly and we model the out of plane uh, shear degradation of, uh, of uh, walls. So this is what we learned and what we observed from the simulations of this building for the maximum considered earthquake using triaxial uh, near fault ground motions. First of all, in uh, five out of the 11 motions, the wall experienced localized uh, compression damage uh, with significant shear deformations at the corners. The shear deformations played a huge role and accounted for more than 50% of the base story deformations in the plastic hinge region. And also very important and critical for the repairability and the post-earthquake functional recovery of the building was the significant vertical growth of the core walls and the damage that this growth causes in the slabs. So let's see a video from the full-scale simulations of the core wall for one of the motions where we see on the screen with the red and orange color, the crushing of the core at the corner. As well as the full, the motion of the full building. And let's focus on two things. First of all, the roof drift ratio, as you see, this is a ground motion that we, we reach close to 2.5% roof drift ratio, but notice the significant residual deformations that you have uh, at the end. And even more important, with the graph shown on the upper right uh, corner, see the elongation of the tension cord of the core wall at the corner of the base story, how much it, uh, it elongates, as well as the shortening of the compression cord. And it's not only the peak values, that the peak deformation that we develop in the, in the bottom story. It is also the residual elongation and the residual, and the residual shortening due to compression damage of these, uh, of, of these regions. In terms of shear deformations, as I told you, more than 50% of the base story deformations were due to shear. And again, I mentioned this is something that we ignore in nonlinear seismic analysis practice. And in many cases, even in, uh, in, uh, in uh, research, in, in academic research in this uh, area. So if you want to capture accurately the evolution of damage and failure in these plastic hinge regions of the walls, there is no other, there is no way to do this without a method that ex explicitly models 
nonlinear flexure shear interaction and that can capture the softening and degradation mechanisms that result in this type of damage and, uh, and behavior. And last but not least, the very important observation is the significant growth of the core walls. I show you here from this uh, ground motion simulation of, the, of this building, what happened in one of the ground motions that we saw the video before of the, of the lateral response. But see here is what happens in the vertical direction. This graph shows the vertical displacement of uh, one of the corners of the core wall where the, the core wall at the roof during the ground motion elongates, elongates nearly to 10 inches. So the wall grows gradually along the stories and at the roof, this accumulated growth uh, uh, reaches nearly 10 inches of growth. So this growth occurs only in the wall. The columns, because they are much more slender and smaller section, they don't experience this growth. So this differential vertical displacement between the core wall and the, and the columns result in, in significant inelastic demands in the slabs where combined with the gravity and the cyclic nature of the ground motion, they develop yield lines and significant residual deformations. So in my opinion, this is another thing that we overlook, we do not consider even in performance-based seismic design practice. And uh, I believe that in many cases, this is a type of damage and uh, uh, that will result in uh, non-repairable buildings in future earthquakes uh, that uh, we may have uh, uh, to resolve. And how we can resolve it? So here is one first proposal. This is work that uh, uh, I did with my former PhD students, Dr. Kalugaru and Dr. Lu at, uh, at UC Berkeley, where we designed uh, the, the core wall to rock. And uh, we, pro we provide, uh, we cast the wall inside the steel cell only at the bottom story in order to provide the best possible confinement and uh, damage resistance against compression damage, of course. And we also unbond the vertical reinforcement or we use external uh, BRB devices in order to, uh, to decouple uh, the, the nonlinearity in uh, flexure and shear in the, in the concrete. Even more important or equally important here, an ingredient, it is that we use pond tension. And the advantage of this pond tension strands, it is that this growth that, that we saw before for the cold wall can be eliminated, can be reduced significantly with the pond tension. So at the end of the motion, at least the most of this growth has been recovered and we don't have significant residual deformations between the, uh, the, the, the core wall and the columns and the residual deformations in the slabs. A video from relevant simulations that we did in 2014 with, uh, with uh, Dr. Lu in uh, OpenSys, showing the rocking of the core wall and the almost fully recentering at the end of the ground motions. So this is a method that at least can reduce large part of the, of the of the residual displacements problem, but of course it cannot do much in terms of the of the peak drift that you develop in an earthquake. And I mentioned the peak drift because the peak drift is the one that controls the damage in the displacement sensitive non-structural parts like partitions and, and other non-structural components. So if somebody is interested to control even this type of damage and especially at the maximum considered earthquake. In my opinion, the best solution for this is only one, and it is the base isolation, which in, uh, in my opinion is uh, it's, uh, the best technology uh, and actually a very a highly developed and mature technology that we have, which unfortunately in US is not uh, widespread and it's not used extensively, at least for, for residential and the uh, office buildings. So here I show you a, a case, a design development where this a 20 story core wall building, we design it with base isolation, two different and equivalent designs. At the top, 
you see using only friction pendulums. And here in the US, EPS has a, a wealth of experience and information and uh, designs uh, uh, many of uh, base isolated structures with these uh, highly tested and uh, validated devices, both in the US and worldwide, but also another design showing at the bottom, which combines flat sliders with uh, rubber bearings. So the way that this system works is the, the flat sliders that they have uh, a friction coefficient up to, up to about 10%, uh, provide the, most of the resistance and the energy dissipation. And then we have the rubber bearings that they provide the restoring force that result in this bilinear behavior that you see, which is uh, similar to the, to the bilinear behavior that uh, a single or a double uh, friction pendulum has. So here is a design with a, where for this 20 story building at the MC with an effective period of 3.8 seconds and with uh, isolation displacement demands of 32 inches. And these are well within the capabilities of, uh, of uh, all these devices. Uh, these years we can uh, sustain the MC with very uh, minimum damage. And here you see a comparison of the response. With the green is the response of the base isolated structures. And with the red is the response of the code minimum fixed base design. So the differences are huge in, in terms of story drifts, story shares, and also floor accelerations that control the response and damage of uh, acceleration sensitive non-structural components. So my experience from these studies, and uh, I would like to mention here that estimating cost, you know, for any building project or for any structural engineering project, especially these days, is very difficult with all these uncertainties. It depends highly on the very specifics of each project, location, even the period of the year and the period of time that uh, uh, that uh, the, the project will be conducted and constructed. But just to give you a very approximate and very rough uh, idea about uh, uh, the cost increase, in order to design a, an eight-story building and going from code minimum design to a design with base isolation, where essentially having a structure that will be demolished after the earthquake with a code minimum design, after the MC, I would like to, to emphasize this. Reaching the state where the damage can be easily repaired, we talk about an increase of cost that ranges between four to 10%. So this is the cost increase in order to go from code minimum design, fixed base, not even performance-based design. So linear analysis, linear response spectrum analysis, the absolutely minimum of the code, all the way to earthquake resilient design at the maximum considered earthquake. Not only the design level earthquake, but the, at the maximum considered earthquake. And this estimate that I give you here is based on an assumption that the cost of the structural part is uh, approximately 20% of the total cost of the building. Because as you know, the largest part of the cost in all building projects are the non-structural parts are the architectural feature, features, the glazing, uh, the, the, the cladding, the, the electric and the mechanical equipments. All these are what uh, compose uh, more than 80% of the, of the cost. The relevant simulation, we get very close to the end of the presentation, showing the comparison of the fixed base versus the base isolation for an MCE level motion. You see clearly the difference in the, in the intensity and the magnitude of the drifts of the core wall. It's day with night. And one more example from some concept uh, designs developments that we have done here at NYA uh, for 30 story tall buildings using base isolation. Again, it's it's an amazing technology that can allow you even to sustain with control damage, uh, severe MC level of shaking, even for, for tall buildings uh, of, uh, in, that, uh, in that range. So with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I apologize in advance if I took a little bit longer.
and uh, I hope that uh, you have many questions which I will answer very happily. I can't hear any of you. This is really bad news for me. I guess, um, yeah, go for it. All right, so my question is, uh, well, first of all, thank you for this great talk. It was super interesting. So my question is, uh, to, to what degree of uh, confidence do you have in your estimate on the cost increase with the base isolator structure versus the non-isolated structure. Uh, and um, I also have a second question. Uh, up to how many stories would you consider uh, seismic isolation to be feasible for a building? Okay, let me answer. First of all, thank you. Very interesting and important question. Let me answer first the first part. As I described you, uh, this, uh, these uh, estimates of cost increase are very approximate, very rough, and it is very difficult, especially these days, to have uh, you know to provide a range of the of the of the cost increase. Highly depends on the specifics of the project, even the location and the period of the year of the specific year that the project will be will be done. Even the cost of isolation devices change significantly even of material of reinforcing steel and, uh, and concrete. So with this, uh, I would like that you take these estimations very as very, you know, very lightly as very uh, approximate. Now, regarding the second part, again, to give you specific numbers in terms of number of stories, it depends uh, highly on the, on the specifics of the project. One thing that is, uh, that is very, important and critical regarding the feasibility of base isolation for tall buildings is the aspect ratio of the of the of the building you know height versus the shortest dimension of the floor plate so you know the more slender of building the toughest it becomes to use base isolation because then we have the issue of the uplift there are solutions for the uplift but uh, this is an entire uh, lecture now from my experience uh, from reviewing uh, the literature and the engineering practice around the world, you know, especially in Japan, there are many tens, I don't know if even if there are hundreds of uh, base isolated tall buildings. And uh, I'm, a, I'm aware, and this is something that I cover explicitly in my online course, in lectures three and four, I'm aware even of uh, more than 40 story tall uh, uh, buildings in Japan that uh, that they have been uh, base isolated. All right, thank you. And also, and also in US, the tallest base isolated building that we have is the retrofitted uh, Los Angeles uh, City Hall, which is actually a project that uh, it was uh, it was designed the retrofit using uh, isolators from uh, uh, from Nabi Yusuf Associates. It was uh, one of the, uh, I think, first and uh, very major projects that uh, uh, that uh, Nabi Youssef, uh, president and the founder of uh, NYA, uh, did. Yeah, I, Congratulations! I see, Thank you. Okay. I can see Sergio Godinez. You can ask. Thank you, Franco. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panagiotto. Uh, for the great lecture and happy birthday. Thank I you. hope you go to celebrate after this courtesy of PSE. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have several questions, but I just want to ask one. Um, you mentioned that you did the analysis of this 14 story building using also vertical ground motions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have a comparison of the response with and without vertical ground motions and how different was the response between both of them? Yes, we have a, um, we have a comparison, and uh, actually this is a, a comparison that we we include in a, in a journal paper that uh, we hope that uh, it is under review, and we hope that shortly 
very soon will be published. Uh, the comparison, excuse me, the comparison for the specific case was not very significant, was not very important. We talk about differences of the order of 10%, maximum 15% for more for most uh, response parameters. And the largest effect was in the axial demands of the columns, of course, as, as you expect, but also in the vertical displacements and the residual displacements of the slab, because this vertical motion, this the, the vertical component of the ground motion increases even more the vertical acceleration because you have vertical accelerations in the slabs, even from lateral movement, because the core wall uh, grows. So the slab goes up and down and this develops accelerations, but the vertical components increases the vertical response of the slab even more. And this, especially if you form yield lines in the slab can have a, a larger effect on the, on the vertical deflection of the slabs and the residual damage there. But for the lateral responses, no more than 10% difference. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for that paper then. And now that you mentioned the, the slabs and the yield lines, perhaps for the 14 story buildings, it's not very critical, but for taller buildings, oh, no. the, the rotate, well, I, I, but I mean- Sorry for interrupting. Actually, it's, it's not only critical for this 14 story building. If you, if you experience this motion and you have this damaged state after the earthquake, uh, for this building, in my opinion, is that this building cannot be repaired. Because if you have 2% residual drift in the slabs, how you are going to, to repair all the slabs uh, along the story? Or who, who would be feel safe or interested to live in a building that you throw a ball on the floor and rolls? And do you have any comment about how to, because I mean, there are a lot of like flat slabs buildings in, in the West Coast and even taller buildings that perhaps the, the rotational demands on the slab will cause the yield lines. I totally, I totally agree with you. And this is something that uh, we don't, uh, we don't uh, pay special attention in, uh, in engineering practice, even in performance base. And uh, I believe that, you know, if you have large drift demands, it's unavoidable that you have these uh, significant elongations and deformations in the slab. So, and, and we have observed these things even in, uh, in the Chile earthquake. It's not that we, we see these things for first time here. Even in the seven story building, we measure explicitly the growth of the, of the wall and the deformations in the slab and they were large. So it's something that we will have to, to deal with, I believe in future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Claudio Sepulveda. Hi, uh, thank you for, for your presentation, Dr. Uh, Panagiotis. Um, I had a question related to, to the model, the beam plus model. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, a, in a frame element, for example, in a distributed plasticity, a fiber-based element, uh, it's well known that, that if you don't regularize, regularize your, your, your material, you can have some localization problems. Um, and in general, if you work with, with reinforced concrete, uh, you may have to deal with, with some localization problems, some mesh dependent and, and everything. So from my understanding, uh, beam trust model may also suffer uh, of, of localization or mesh we, dependent. We explicitly account for this. So by the time that you define the mesh, in the and I talk about the beam trust model in the FE multi this version, automatically the program adjust the stress strain behavior of concrete to account for mesh effects. And the, in the paper, and in some of the papers that we have published, but also in the paper that we will, uh, we expect to have published on the 14 story building with the dynamic analysis, we show explicitly that we achieve nearly perfect mesh objectivity. So almost zero sensitivity. And uh, how we do this? Because from the first day that we developed this model, we accounted for the for uh, uh, for um, adjusting the stress strain curves based on the size of the mesh, so that uh, so that we don't have uh, results which are and analysis which is sensitive to the to the size of the mesh. 
So this is fully resolved. And this is something that uh, Professor Bazant has addressed decades now in his books. And uh, you know, various finite element uh, models and techniques account for this explicitly. So not only we account for this, but we account for this in a 100% automated way. In OpenSys, for example, you need, if you want to define the beam trans model, you need to, uh, to define the stress strain curve manually based on the size of the mesh that you will do. In the BTM component, as well as in the BTM in FE multi -fish, you don't have to define anything. You just define the mesh and then the program automatically adjusts all the stress strain curves to achieve mesh objectivity. And I believe that this is a huge advantage of the, of the implementation and the development that uh, Professor Kutsumanos has done in, uh, in the FE multi -fish program. And, and this automatic realization is also implemented in the OpenSys version? The automatic implementation, no, it's not. In okay. OpenSys, when mm -hmm. you define the beam trust model, mm -hmm. you need to define your materials and the materials need to be defined based accounting for the size of your mesh. Mm -hmm. So everything needs to be defined manually. And yeah. this, I think it's, uh, it's something that takes a lot of time. And this is why these days I don't want even to hear about BTM in OpenSys. Okay, thank you. I think you can go, uh, Omar. Awesome. Um, thank you, Marius, for the presentation. I found the, um, the part about uh, the Long Beach Civic Center to be fascinating. Um, I guess there's a few things there that might be might be interesting. One is you mentioned that there was um, both structural and non-structural enhancements made to the building. I think similar to a previous question, if you could comment on the, the cost deltas of each to achieve the, ta the targets you, you've mentioned. I think for non-structural, you mentioned some anchorage um, as well as I, I, I read the Structure Magazine article, like there's a, a lot that was done in the facade to you know, prevent moisture from getting into the building. Can you speak about what was the, the least and most expensive parts and just, the, just a sense of what costs each of those improvements entailed above code? I, again, thank, thank you for the question. Very interesting and very important. Uh, first thing, this, this building, the overall design, and, um, and I don't talk about the, only the seismic part, the overall, you know, the, the gravity design, the architectural features, the mechanical features, and the requirements were very different compared to the typical and uh, buildings that we use for residential and uh, for office buildings. And the reason is that this, this is the, the new civic center of one of the buildings is the new civic center of the city of Long Beach. And the second building is the headquarters of the port of Long Beach that we talk about a major mm -hmm. economic activity. So they want to have buildings that after the earthquake, at least they can host you know, all the operations and the services and the uh, uh, management of the, you know, of, the, of the city and the port after, after an earthquake event. So even the, the upfront cost to satisfy these elevated requirements, architectural, mechanical, and electrical, are very different compared with a regular uh, residential or uh, offices building. So, and of course, this increases to, to a more expensive structure. Now, I cannot provide you specific numbers, first of all, because I don't have them at the top of my mind, and I don't want to say something inaccurate. And second of all, because you know, to find this information and disclose depends uh, on the project specifics and uh, there are also limitations. Now, mm -hmm. regarding the other part of your question, what were the cost, it, uh, the effect on the cost because of the elevated, of the more enhanced seismic design? I can say two things for sure. Again, I cannot provide specific numbers, but I'm telling you the following. So this, this, this building, if it was designed based on code minimum requirements, we would have a drift limit of 2% for the design earthquake, for the walls. Here we design the structure 
to achieve less than 1% drift at the design earthquake. Because this is, this is the, the drift limit in order to have significant damage in the partitions. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that was the main, the main reason. Because if you have all the partitions damaged in a building like this, the repair time uh, goes to a few months. And also the repair cost goes well beyond 5% of the initial cost of the building. So because of that, automatically you understand that the, the core walls were thicker and more reinforcement. So a part of the cost increase is because of that. Purely uh, increase uh, cost because of uh, uh, la larger core walls, thicker, more reinforcement, and larger foundations. The foundation is a very important part when the, the design forces go up, it is, it is costly. The other part that increase uh, related to the seismic response that results in an increase of the cost, it was because as, uh, as you also said, uh, we increased, the, we calculated accurately the, the anchorage demands for the non-structural components using non-linear analysis. So this is already a significant uh, increase compared with the demands that you would calculate from the code. And also, instead of using an R factor for the non-structural components, which I think is five or six, we use an R factor of two for the anchorage of these components. So all the anchorage forces went increased significantly compared to the code minimum. And this had a direct effect on the, on the increase of the cost related with the uh, anchorage of uh, uh, non-structural components. But I cannot, I, I don't have, I, I'm not ready to give you specific numbers. That makes sense. Would you say the scope, um, modif I guess the scope of the anchorage, would you say that was mostly material um, labor? Because I feel like for some stuff, I mean, you're just changing the, the design forces. It doesn't sound like a very substantial upgrade compared to the facade, right? Like, I mean- Again, excellent question. I. I have not worked closely with the details of this part. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. It doesn't feel as like something crazy, but uh, you know, some non-structural components, for example, like elevators can be very expensive. Mm. That makes sense. Because they are very complex. It's not like, uh, you know, anchorage of a bookshelf or of a desk. Yeah. Uh, this type of, and you then you have all the the electric and the plumbing, which also it is a large number of supports and a lot of work. I see. It, it, it's the things that we don't see as uh, occupants. That makes sense. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mm. I have a, a question about uh, this uh, resilient design. It can be used to optimize a structure that are uh, uh, optimize a structure that maybe using the code is uh, are I don't know uh, so restrictive in some uh, part of the design. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't say that. The the main problem with our codes is that uh, essentially the codes. And when mm -hmm. you define according, according to the code, uh, essentially there is no consideration about damage. Oh, okay. There is no consideration about damage and downtime because the code cares only about one thing, that uh, approximately you will end up with a structure that has a low probability of collapse given the occurrence of the maximum considered earthquake. So I think... Mm -hmm. It's even meaningless talk about optimizing when the code minimum designs, we don't even check something for the maximum considered earthquake. Now, okay. if your question is if nonlinear response history analysis can be used to relax some of the uh, requirements in code prescriptive design, I would say, yes, this can happen. Again, depends on a project by project basis, but the limitations and assumptions in code minimum design are so large in terms of damage and level of seismic hazard that we consider that I, can, I cannot think too many cases where uh, you will really end up with a more economical structure just by using 
nonlinear analysis compared with with code minimum design. Some engineers they have started to use now these days more nonlinear analysis because of the increase in the CR force in code prescriptive design in, a, in ACI. But my opinion is that uh, soon they will realize that in most cases, these amplification factors are actually even smaller than what you obtain from nonlinear analysis. Just, oh, I see. just my opinion. Okay, okay. Well, I, I had other questions about the uh, core world uh, growth. Uh, have I, I think you mentioned it, but uh, did you? Uh, it has been uh, measured in real structures, and how Measure can we uh, the, 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 the the core wall uh, growth? Uh, the, the 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 last part of your presentation. Uh, Tell me which slide you would like me to. Uh, this one you present that there are there is a, some lengthening of the of the wall ah, because okay, okay. of the yeah. yes this part it has been measured in real structures uh, to compare uh, with what is happening in the model with the real structures. Yes, we have uh, we have observed uh, we have observed this both in the seven story building in the test, and we have captured this explicitly in our models, but also mm -hmm. in. Uh, in the Chile and in the New Zealand earthquake, there were many structures that were damaged beyond repair because of damage in the slab. Oh. So, yes. Now, if you ask me if exactly this type of damage has been observed with the core wall and these long spans of the slab in an earthquake, I don't think so. And the reason is very simple because I don't know any earthquake that uh, has happened uh, near this type of uh, very regular and uh, very modern core wall buildings. Okay, thank if you. you know, if you know one, I would be very interested. I would, I would visit the structure personally. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I don't know if we have more questions. Hey, one, one is in the chat. Okay. Which one? Oh, we just have one question in the chat, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that was directed to me. Yeah, yeah, I got it covered. So, um, Marius, uh, uh, last question here is, um, since, um, so at what point, if you could define like the, the height or the number of- Let me advertise a little bit my stuff. Okay. I'm kidding. Please go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, no, no, I got it, I got it. It's so. At what point, at what threshold for the number of stories does the torsional motion of the building uh, become more relevant in seismic response? If you could just comment on that and provide some intuition. At what? Uh, can you please repeat? I missed the so, one part. Is there is there a relationship between, say, the number of stories and uh, the like, essentially like the torsional response? Um, I guess I guess the question is more or less like. I mean, I, I, I understand your question. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, for uh, I, I first of all, I don't think that there is a closed form or something that. But to give you in terms of number of stories, but if your quest is your question only for core wall buildings or in general for enforced concrete buildings, I would say for core wall. Okay, for core wall, you have this thing. The core, the core wall is excellent in terms of providing, you know, lateral stiffness. But if your if your floor plate is much larger compared with the area of the core, automatically you understand that you have a, a torsion issue. Uh, I have seen I have seen cases where uh, uh, if the core is not uh, big enough, that the first even the first mode that we obtain is the torsional after 20, 25 stories. But this is only if the, if the core is, uh, you know, very depends on the, depends on the specifics of the, of the floor plate. With core walls, I don't think that it is easy to have torsional uh, issues uh, for, you know, for medium rise. Mm, that makes sense. Thank you. But again, if you overdo it and the core wall is, uh, is very small, 
as an area compared with the floor plate, you can have a, a significant torsional response even for a medium rise structure. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And if you have further questions, uh, feel free to, to email me. It may take some time to, to respond, but I will try to respond to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. <laughs>